I normally like to give a little prologue ahead of my talk just to clarify what I'm trying to communicate. And I think on this one in particular, it's less about um, any specific idea and more just going beyond that question that I hear more times than not, which is, what's the best way to fix my bloating, heal my gut, uh, sort out all of this? Because hopefully in about half an hour or so, it will be clear why I think that's always the wrong question to ask. And inadvertently also touch on the second most common question I ask, which is why aren't we dealing with the gut now? Um, so that's pretty much where we're going. So a very brief introduction about myself. I'm a nutritional therapist. I've done that for the last 14 years. Um, I often use little quotes like data, not dogma, uh, because I think that that's actually an easier way to do things. I've spent quite a lot of time running statistical analysis of my results. So for those of you who like Bayesian reasoning, that's uh, the driving force behind it, combined with a little bit of common sense. And what that's actually allowed me to do is to work out when we're likely to get certain results and when we're likely to fail. So that's going to be the, the, the underpinning of the uh, ideas and the results that I'm going to refer to as we go through. Um, now, I think most people in this room uh, would definitely fall under the bracket of a self-selected population. You probably know a little bit more about the gut than the general population. But did you know how impressive gonorrhea is? <laughs> yeah, who saw that coming? Uh, so gonorrhea can actually pull 100,000 times its own weight. Which to put into context, if a human being was to pull 22 jumbo jets, that's the same strength that some bacteria have relative to humans. So that's pretty cool. Um, certain flagellate bacteria can run or move through the bloodstream at 60 times their body length per second. Human equivalent would be running at 200 miles an hour. So I just thought I'd pepper that in because I think those facts are cool. But mainly, um, as you've probably uh, been, been hearing a lot more, we're more bacteria than we are human. Obviously, there's, there's books out there that talk of us being outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacterial cells. And actually, more recent research indicates it might be closer 1 to 1, but the numbers don't really matter. The fact is there are more bacterial cells in your body than there are human cells, and, and that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, I've just highlighted a few key points there that really does have an impact on our lives, illnesses, obesity, the just day-to-day -day existence of life. If something's affecting your ability to activate your central nervous system, it's actually altering inflammation and in the profiles that allow certain areas of your brain to light up. There's not many things that we can look into that's going to have a bigger impact. Even just one specific compound produced by microbes in the gut, butyrate or butyric acid. It's a short chain fatty acid. It can act as a fuel for the colon, so hugely important for healthy and regular digestive movement. But on top of that, 450 genes depend on an ongoing supply of butyrate in order to function the way they should. And that's especially important in regards to thyroid function, inflammation, and energy signaling. The body is actually using butyrate as a surrogate marker for, is everything okay down here? And of course, let's remember, this is the single biggest surface where our bodies interact with the environment. So approximately 20 meters squared. Um, so the size of a tennis court is in contact with the outside environment. Because your gut is the outside environment, a tube of the outside that just happens to run through the middle of our bodies, which is kind of weird. Um, so many different problems that we can see whenever the microbiome are not in imbalance. And this is where it is really worthwhile just taking a step back to, to consider how many individual things can trace themselves directly back to the imbalance in the gut. 
So if you have microbes that are stealing certain nutrients, well, how are you ever going to run your metabolism in a way that allows for a sufficient immune response? And this is a perfect example. There's certain microbes, for example, uh, uh, yeah, Proteus mirabilis, that may well have an impact on your vitamin B2 storage. Let's just take vitamin T B2, for example. What does that do? Multiple things, but that's so crucial to allow your body to produce energy. If you can't produce energy, you can't invoke an immune system response properly, as we will get to, which means you're never going to be able to kill off the very microbes that are causing these problems. And these are the sort of catch-22 situations that we see all the time when it comes to the gut, because that is such a huge factor on what your body receives. Not only that, it's uh, the, the front line of your inflammatory response which of course can alter your thyroid function. It can activate your adrenal response. The, the hormonal downstream impacts of that are immeasurable. And yes, are you going to keep out the stuff that shouldn't be in there? This is all very, very relevant when it comes to uh, yeah, what's going on in the gut. Most of you will probably be quite familiar with the ideas, concepts and research that's coming out now, which is just one scientific paper after another, which just tells us exactly what we might expect. If your gut is messed up, then it doesn't automatically mean you're going to be diagnosed with something bad, but the likelihood of that happening skyrockets. What's particularly interesting for me is not the people that have been diagnosed with Crohn's or intestinal uh, issues that uh, yeah, IBS um, will we'll ignore the, uh, <laughs> the usefulness of that uh, diagnosis for a second. But yeah, not the people who have actually been diagnosed with particular disorders, but what about the people in between, the people that just don't feel right? Uh, so of course, there's plenty of times when people say to me, well, I feel all right, and I'm doing things that you say should actually be doing me harm. No one's ever told me that I feel fantastic and I've measured my sleep quality, my heart rate variability and my hematocrit levels and they're exactly where I want them to be despite doing what you're telling me that I'm doing is wrong. Um, there's a lot of people who just feel bad and they won't necessarily qualify for a diagnosis and, and that's a really important factor to continue when you consider how many areas are actually associated with gut health. At this point, we're building a picture which would lean towards that Hippocratic statement, probably the most famous one that he made, that all disease begins in the gut. And I think there's some solid basis behind that, although there is also that question of, well, what's behind what's going on in the gut? And, and I want to touch on that also. So at a very, very simple uh, introduction to the way the gut lining works. There's two ways that molecules that we consume in our diet can end up in our bloodstream. And I don't think it really is too much of a challenge to uh, connect up as to why that's so important. We need to eat food in order to access the energy and the nutrients from the food. So thanks for coming out today. Take that away with you. We need to eat. Um, the the interesting thing is how that absor uh, absorption occurs because we can't just indiscriminately let in molecules from our diet. There's plenty of uh, food chemicals that simply don't belong in the human body. I mentioned them on the other screen. Lectins are found in an awful lot of foods, especially grains, nuts, seeds. And our bodies need to employ mechanisms to stop them from being absorbed. Otherwise, we're going to uh, see our immune cells activated by contact with those lectins and systemic inflammation is inevitable. Oxalates are another perfectly good uh, example of toxic chemicals. And uh, yeah, the, these are very common natural pesticides that we'd find in spinach, Swiss chard, uh, various citrus fruits, chocolate, 
Um, also aubergines, sweet potatoes. There's a variety of foods that contain high levels of oxalates and plants have evolved to produce them in order to poison their predators. So to discourage uh, these predators from eating the foods in higher quantities. Good news is humans have evolved to neutralize them in the gut so that we just don't need to worry about them and we can eat these foods without concern. But should there be anything that goes wrong in the gut, there can be a number of scenarios whereby we start to absorb them. And this is where the leaky gut is uh, starting to become more relevant. So um, whether we call it increased intestinal permeability, something that you'd be more likely to see in the scientific journals, or leaky gut, which is what people in my world often use as a phrase. The words we use are irrelevant. What is important is what's going on there. So I've just uh, tried to find the most simple uh, diagram possible because the most of the nutrients we absorb come through the cells that line our guts. So these are the enterocytes, these line uh, the, the surface of our gut. And yeah, whether it's sugars, whether it's nutrients, whether it's pharmaceutical drugs, most of those molecules that we want are actively pulled through the cell in the transcellular pathway. But you'll also get passive absorption of a whole load of uh, nutrients too, and that's between the cells, the paracellular pathway. So here's a question. Which one of those pathways is involved with the leaky gut? Both. Um, so uh, yes, it is very important to recognize, first of all, that it isn't just one or the other because um, yes, there are proteins that line uh, these junctions. So the cloudins, the occludins, the zonulins. Why is zonulin normally spoken of? What, what is it uh, often connected to? Yes, gluten is, is very well known to disrupt the zonulin function. Um, but yes, any sort of inflammatory damage, any sort of oxidative damage can actually separate the uh, gap between those cells. And suddenly, the role that they were meant to play, which is actually restricting movement for uh, relatively small molecules, only 100 and 80 Daltons or below. And that's not a black and white figure, by the way. It's simply a case of the larger the molecule, the lower the rate of exhaustion. And it, it really starts to drop off um, above that size. So suddenly, there is gaps between the cells, which means this incredibly important barrier to stop uh, toxic molecules from actively, uh, sorry, passively getting into your bloodstream they're no longer being protected. But, but what's actually really important um, and plays a bigger role in my work is when the transcellular uh, movement becomes dysregulated. Now, the transcellular movement um, is very, very interesting in the way that it allows us to quickly suck up salt and sugar which are the two things that your body's going to need in any periods of stress. And what's particularly important, this really is a takeaway, is that whenever we activate our stress response, we directly activate SGLTs, sugar-linked protein transporters, on these enterocytes. And that allows for very quick suction, a grabbing, of these nutrients that we need, so especially the sugars and uh, the, the sodium. But there is a cost. And we'll get onto that in a, in a second. Uh, now, whenever we're talking about leaky gut, allergies and autoimmunity, they are very much the two big issues that are often uh, spoken of. Uh, after we've identified the leaky gut. So allergies, they are a, a consequence of your immune system producing antibodies in excess against foreign molecules that should otherwise be considered safe. Uh, specifically what we mean there is that if you eat chicken, 
you should break down the chicken into the protein and the fats and then into the amino acids and the fatty acids and absorb them in those particularly small molecules. If on the other hand your digestive function hasn't worked the way that we might like it to and you have those gaps between the cells, well you know, may passively absorb teeny little bits of chicken. As you can imagine your body is not designed to have small amounts of other animals inside the body and that will naturally invoke some sort of a response. Now just because there's been exposure to this foreign molecule doesn't automatically mean that you're going to develop an allergy. However, if there is any lack of control in the immune system's inflammatory cascade, if there's any sort of leaning towards overreaction, it's a pretty decent bet that sooner or later you're going to overproduce those antibodies against that particular molecule, be it chicken, be it wheat, be it soy or egg. And that's where we start to see a build-up of these antibodies, which are typically referred to as immunoglobulins and subclassified into IgG, IgE. Does anyone know the difference between IgG-mediated reactions and IgE-mediated reactions? Yeah, that's exactly it. So the IgE is the classical allergy reaction, or what is sometimes referred to as a type 1 allergic reaction. That's where you get immediate release of histamine. That's where anaphylaxia is a risk. And yeah, if anybody swells up after consuming a food, the uh, face becoming uh, swollen, the airways closed now, that's an IgE-mediated reaction. That's a classical allergy, which is potentially very, very dangerous. IgG, on the other hand, the mechanisms are very, very similar, but the difference being that histamine isn't necessarily involved immediately. It gets uh, involved at a later date. And so these are the reactions that often take between 20 and 36 hours to manifest, and that's why they're much more difficult to detect. If there's anyone who's suffering from hidden allergies, it's going to be an IgE in general. What's fascinating is actually once you have this increased sensitivity, there's evidence that the inflammatory reactions can actually invoke more leaky gut and thus perpetuate the situation. And it's one of the uh, perfect catch-22s that we're going to see lots of evidence for and why whenever somebody does have allergies, there's often going to be a need to just avoid that food while we resolve the underlying issues that allowed for the production of that allergy in the first place. Now autoimmunity is another really, really big deal. Uh, so whether we're talking about Hashimoto's thyroiditis, diabetes, whether uh, we're dealing with lupus, um, multiple sclerosis, there's a, a whole range of different autoimmune disorders, all of which are characterized by a very similar uh, issue to allergies. Whereas in allergies, the body is producing antibodies that deliberately seek out and attack safe non-self, autoimmunity is the body producing antibodies to seek out and attack safe self. And that can occur through a variety of mechanisms. One of the most popular uh, models that are presented is molecular mimicry, in the sense that if certain compounds enter into the bloodstream and have a similar structure to thyroid tissue, how does the body tell between the two? If in doubt, attack the lot, and that's where we start to see that every single time somebody consumes a particular food, they simultaneously start attacking parts of their own tissue. And that can apply in so many ways. I've worked with one guy for which uh, every time he ate wheat, he actually would become extremely dizzy and he was later on found to have antibodies against his own cerebellum, which, ironically, has a very similar protein structure in parts to wheat. Uh, but equally, there is a, a very common uh, link between what we'd call auto-inflammatory leading on to accidental damage of our own cells, which then calls for a response from our immune system. And this is where we once again arrive back at the endotoxemia. 
What are endotoxins? Yeah, so um, endotoxins uh, is the name uh, that we give to fragments of bacteria. So in our gut, there's going to be trillions and trillions of bacteria. And yeah, when they're there, should they not be tolerogenic species, should they be the bad guys, then they're going to invoke an immune response. What's particularly interesting and very relevant is that when they die, when they are broken down, fragments of their cell wall activate the immune system with a lot more power. And those fragments are called endotoxins, sometimes referred to as lipopolysaccharides. And they're just the most reliable way to invoke an inflammatory response in any mammal. You'll find that almost all of the scientific literature, when they're investigating the anti-inflammatory power of any given intervention, what they will do is take a group without that intervention, a group with that intervention and inject them both with lipopolysaccharides because it's that reliable in invoking an inflammatory response. Now, this is where the in entry of endotoxins from the gut to the circulation is possibly the single biggest uh, factor for me and my work in making human beings feel better. So we'll talk about that just a little bit more in a second, but when we activate a stress response and open up those cells, thus allowing for transcellular transport to take place, those endotoxins can now enter your bloodstream and they will activate your immune system into uh, a disproportionate response. Your immune system over the course of evolution has determined that lipopolysaccharides are an excellent proxy for the risk of sepsis. Because when you actually do get overwhelmed by microbes, it's the lipopolysaccharides that are going to be doing the main activation of your immune system. So this is a very interesting distinction. You can have a leaky gut and the bacteria themselves remain in the gut. On the other hand, these endotoxins, these little fragments of the cell wall, they can cross over into the bloodstream and invoke the exact same response that your body would invoke to sepsis, even though there's no increased bacterial load. In other words, endotoxemia is a state where endotoxins are now building in your bloodstream and tricking your immune system into thinking you are at risk of septic shock, AKA death. As you can imagine in those circumstances, fortune may favor the brave, but evolution favors those that take precautions. And those human beings that survive the evolutionary challenges to pass on their genes and give life to the beautiful people you see in this room today, those are the immune, uh, the immune systems that didn't take chances and at any risk of septic shock invoked a major, arguably disproportionate, inflammatory response against endotoxins. And that's where we see a huge driver for all inflammatory reactions that people experience. Whether they're getting joint pains, whether they're getting brain fog, whether they're getting actual pain in the intestines, I can guarantee you that you're likely to see a lot more of those symptoms every time we actually put them under stress. So this is actually a model that I use with uh, almost every single person I see with chronic health issues, every single person with chronic inflammatory issues. And the permeability part is obviously key, what we're talking about today. Now, there's a little bit more to it, and, and this actually was something that I created in response to trying to explain the physiology behind adrenal fatigue, which of course despite the, 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 the uh, model not necessarily uh, being accurate on a scientific basis, there's a very, very important role for that to play. But what we're looking at here for a lot of people is the multiple factors that occur to increase not only the permeability in the gut, but also the consequences of that permeability. And once you've invoked a stress response, what should happen is your adrenals kick in 
They produce the cortisol you require, which tells your brain, we have this situation under control. Stand down. If that doesn't happen, well, you continue to invoke a stress response. And there's a few factors that might uh, influence your adrenal response. And at this point, what else will affect the permeability? If you've got a baseline permeability and you've just ramped that up with that stress reaction, then yes, your consequences may well be more costly than others. In essence, what we're getting at here is once permeability occurs, your immune system is going to be exposed to these endotoxins and you are going to release cytokines. Yes, there's certain factors that will allow you to maintain a proportionate response. But for the majority of the people that I work with, of course, a self-selecting population by definition because they've sought out my help, we don't see this inflammatory control, meaning that every time they do exercise, this stress results in permeability. And that permeability results in the toxemia and a major cytokine response, which obviously causes even more stress. Equally, every human being is still subject to this same uh, pattern, but if we had a regulated uh, inflammatory cascade, we may well find we just feel tired at the end of a hard day. We feel a bit, a bit shitty. Have a sleep, get on with it. But that won't happen once you've actually crossed sufficient threshold that the cytokine load is so high that it will now, A, cause symptoms. We'll see shutdown of the dopaminergic behavioral column, which makes people feel weak, shaky, and unable to think properly. But we'll also see further activation of the stress response. And this is one of the reasons why when it comes to any long-term chronic inflammatory issue, there's so many angles through which we can intervene, whether it's boosting the adrenal response, whether it's reducing permeability in the gut, whether it's controlling inflammatory factors so that you don't overreact. Of course, sometimes it's nice not to be stressed, so give that some thought as well. Okay, so this is now where we're focusing more on the gut. So hopefully that gave us a reasonable idea of the central nature of the gut, especially in regards to the, the permeability and uh, how once that permeability is affected, bad things happen. So the common intervention for gut probiotics is by far and away the single most common. And Probiotics are a really, really big deal. That's your good bacteria that help you break down foods, that help you produce B vitamins, K vitamins, they're anti-inflammatory, they produce butyric acid to maintain normal intestinal movement. They are so intrinsic to a healthy function of the gut. Prebiotics, fiber, feed the good guys. Betaine hydrochloride, that augments your stomach acid. Such an important factor. Your stomach acid isn't just there to help you break down protein. It's also there to create the acidic environment. That pH acts as a trigger so that your bile can actually be released from the gallbladder. Your pancreatic enzymes can be activated and also that your gut has the right pH because you need to maintain some acidity there to avoid a friendly environment for the bad guys. So many people forget to look at hydrochloric acid levels, which is so common. If you're stressed, we would expect your hydrochloric acid production to drop. Digestive enzymes, relatively simple. They're replacing your lipase, protease, amylase enzymes that would otherwise be there to break down your foods. Antimicrobials, kill off the bad guys you can't actually uh, replace with the good unless there's space. There's not going to be any space unless you've killed off the bad guys. Vitamin A, who here eats their liver? If not, shame on you. But uh, the vitamin A is so relevant to maintain a strong uh, integral structure of the gut lining and very much overlooked. Nucleotides are here, you're going to hear some more about in, in a due while, but also found in liver. Antimicrobials, we're not gonna linger on the individual functions of all of these various antimicrobials. They are going to severely compromise, but not automatically kill. And that, of course, 
lead us on to possibly the single biggest crux of everything that I've led up to so far, which is when people ask me, what's the best thing to do for the gut? There isn't one best thing because everybody's conditions are very different. You know, what's, what's the function there in the gut? What's the microbiome looking at? You know, what's their adrenal response? How much stress are they under? Are they sleeping right? Do they have good turnover of the cells lining the gut? What's the pH? Can the, hopefully what I've actually uh, touched on there is that you can take the perfect intervention but if the conditions aren't actually fruitful for it to work, then it won't work. And then this is why we sometimes see what I suspect is more clickbait than a contribution to science, that probiotics don't work. Because there are plenty of studies where probiotics just don't work. Of course, we don't get to see the details on what was that particular population, um, what separated them from the studies where probiotics are shown to work extremely well. But what we can take from a combination of all those studies is that probiotics should work, but don't always. Now, I've touched on a few physiological factors here, but the single biggest factor is, does your immune system work? So many times, especially on forums, you'll see people talking about their various anti-candida protocols, and we'll be talking about, well, I tried this antimicrobial and this probiotic and I got some die off, so it must be working. Um, and so, but then I didn't really get anywhere. So what I did is I dropped my carbs down to 60 grams a day and I felt awful, so it must be working. Um, but I didn't actually feel any better afterwards. So what I did is I added more probiotics and that didn't really do anything. So I added more antimicrobials and that didn't really do anything. So I just stopped eating carbs altogether and I felt horrendous. So it must have been working finally and then they get nowhere. No one's asking that one question, which is, does your immune system actually work? And there's two ways I would approach that. Sometimes the immune system cannot invoke a full response. Other times it won't. When it comes to it can't being able to invoke a response, it's almost always going to be down to energy signaling in some way. We need the energy signaling that goes on within our central nervous system to actually provide permission to invoke a sufficient response. Um, I could go off onto various different experiments that have shown how this plays out, but one uh, interesting uh, experiment that I think sums it up quite nicely is one done with rodents. Six of them given vitamin D, six of them left vitamin D in insufficient given the same bacterial challenge. And what's interesting is every single one of those uh, rodents that had sufficient vitamin D had actually invoked a full response and actually come out of it after 11 hours. Seven days later, most of the vitamin D uh, short, uh, vitamin D insufficient rodents were still in the midst of an ongoing halfway house reaction, which is exactly what we see in people with chronic inflammatory issues. They can't invoke a full response to win, but they still sustain a halfway house, which is the worst of all worlds. Um, equally, it's not just about energy signaling. What's your mitochondria doing? You need the mitochondria of your white blood cells in order to produce reactive oxygen species. That's what actually kills the microbes in question when they've been weakened by the antimicrobials we uh, spoke of in previous slides. But there's only so long you can maintain that before it becomes highly dysfunctional, highly maladaptive, and suddenly your mitochondria start to suffer and contribute further to inflammation without helping you to win. Equally, another huge common mistake when people are trying to actually change their micro, uh, microbial balance we're giving probiotics, bacteria, but the body cannot kill off its competition. To kill off bacteria, yeast, and viruses, you need to invoke a Th1 response from your immune system. Without getting too distracted, there are two main arms. It's not quite as simple as it just being two, but there are two main arms, Th1, to kill off cellular threats, bacteria, viruses, yeast. Th2, to kill off larger 
circulating threats. This is the humoral response. But if you have parasite issues, that will automatically invoke a Th2 response. Why is that important? Because these two arms counterbalance one another. In other words, if you have a parasite issue, yes, you're going to get inflammatory uh, reactions from the Th2 branch of your immune system, but just as importantly, you're actually seeing suppression of your Th1 response. How could you possibly expect to kill off the bacteria and yeast if that part of your immune system is suppressed? Equally, mold is in uh, mold exposure will very reliably elevate the Th2 response and give you multiple inflammatory symptoms, but the key insult is that there's nothing left to invoke Th1. Almost there, people. Now, just as important is not just the mechanics. We shouldn't just look at this as uh, engineers looking for which parts are missing their relevant cofactors. Sometimes your immune system simply will not invoke effectively because it's choosing not to in order to protect yourself. We're mainly talking here about stress and the way that whenever we activate our sympathetic nervous systems, we instantly release some adrenaline. There are adrenaline receptors on all of your white blood cells that instantly release inflammatory signals to get you ready to fight off any uh, microbes that may well enter your circulation when you are clawed at or when you fall in an escape. But equally, we see a substantial drop in the ability to invoke that full response. Once you don't have the available resources, your body is not going to be able to invoke a full immune response. So actually looking into the various steps, and we won't, we won't delve into the differences between the innate and the specific immune systems, but just know that there's a highly active signaling cascade, all of which generally needs to work fully to win that fight. And multiple steps of that will be inhibited after long-term stress. Short-term stress, generally quite good for your immune system if that's invoked on an overly regular basis or a continual basis, we get dysregulation and we get stuck in this getting ready to be cut um, and the pro-inflammatory state, but without the ability to finish the job. Worst of both worlds. Now, obviously for a lot of people, this information is interesting, but how could they use it? Um, how does this play out in terms of the decision that we need to make as to are you ready to kill off the bad guys and replace them with the good. I think it's very difficult to ask ourselves how stressed we are because by definition the stress response is activated in a part of the brain that is subconscious. Um, and asking someone how stressed they are is generally fairly pointless. Equally, how, how many people will know what their leptin sensitivity is, their thyroid status, their vitamin D. So what it comes down to in real life. This is a very reasonable approximation on whether I think somebody is ready to actually undertake a protocol to fix the conditions in their gut, which is mainly going to be about killing off the bad guys and replacing with the good guys. So are they being suppressed? So if someone's taking steroid medication, forget about it. It's not going to work the way that it should. Equally, if there's that Th2 uh, trigger biotoxin, so, which means mold. Uh, sometimes uh, Lyme bacteria can contribute to the biotoxin load as well. Uh, parasites or any other immunosuppressive medication, such as those uh, used for rheumatoid arthritis, for example. That's going to have a very potent impact on what we actually can invoke. Do they have enough energy? For that, I would like to take their temperatures. People should be able to see a temperature of about 36.6, 36.7 upon waking, and about 37 after lunch. And that's core temperatures. And we measure that rectally. If there's a substantial difference between someone's rectal temperature and their oral temperature, that's a very good sign that there's going to be a an inflammatory reaction, hence why the energy delivery is being distorted because it's being drained so badly. But check your temperatures, and if they're dysregulated, the statistical likelihood of you actually getting good results from this antidysbiosis protocol are very, very low. 
Um, growth hormone plays a huge role in the uh, function of our immune system, mainly through its uh, ability to break down the RNA of microbes that we're trying to kill. That's the ribonucleic acid, which is the communicating signals that uh, allow our DNA to actually do what it's meant to do. Don't worry too much about the ins and outs of how growth hormone does that. Just get enough sleep and get good enough quality sleep. That's a big subject in its own right, but if you are not getting eight hours of quality sleep each night and waking up rested, your likelihood of getting success from an antidysbiosis protocol isn't good. And then adrenal function. We, we've seen how big a role that plays in checking the stress response so that there's no need to reach for an emergency helping of sugar and salt and thus no need to open up those intestinal cells and thus no need to have all those endotoxins into your bloodstream. The adrenal balance is so important there. Glutathione, that's your body's natural antioxidants. You can get IV injections, you can get um, liposomal glutathione. That has a huge role on signaling within the inflammatory cascade. And of course, vitamin D. Not only does it help invoke the strong response, your innate response depends on vitamin D uh, proteins, but it's also helpful to control the overall activity of your immune system so that you don't get disproportionate uh, inflammation. And of course, does your body feel safe enough to invest in a heavily costly immune reaction. And that's where stress is a really, really big deal and we won't go too much into it. Um, okay, got a few exciting references and that's where I'm at. I um, joined Instagram like three weeks ago, so um, yeah, I'm now part of uh, the millennials. Uh, so, but yes, um, we've reached the point where I stop speaking continuously. So now, what questions do you have? No worries. Yes, I, uh, anyone who wants to email me afterwards, um, my email is marrick at marrickdoyle.com. Um, so if you remember my name, you should be okay there. Just drop me a line, I'll send you the slides. <laughs> Okay, so when it comes to leaky gut, my favorite test is actually one uh, done through Cyrex Labs. Yeah, so um, the main reason being is that that actually includes a marker for lipopolysaccharides. Um, and I've always been a little bit underwhelmed with some of the leaky gut testing. Um, so sort of traditionally it was a case of let's look at the absorption of the maltitol versus uh, larger sugars and, and, and then we're using that as a proxy to see well given that the ramno shouldn't really be in the bloodstream and therefore shouldn't have an opportunity to make its way into the urine by recovering back the sugars from the urine we can determine whether there's leaky gut. I never really felt there was that much of a strong correlation between the results I was seeing there and what I was seeing in real life. And, but the lipopolysaccharides, um, that movement seemed to be the most valuable test marker that we could ever uh, obtain that gave me predictive value. Before I even saw the individual, this, this guy's got some serious inflammatory issues going on. So that would be my favorite. But there's various ways you can look at it. DAO levels actually have a very strong predictive value of leaky gut. It's not just about genetic expression, which is often what people think. Uh, Calprotecting, EPX, um, which are, those last two are included in Genova's GI effects, which I think is a very interesting stool test. That's mainly looking at the state of the microbiome and it uses the gene technology in order to recover a much better, more rich picture of what's going on. Whereas old, stool, old school stool testing would always have to culture them, which means there's so many issues in the viability after producing this tool, how much dye, so on and so forth. So yeah, yeah that GI effects from uh, Genova I think is a really good test here. And it does give us some ideas as to what's going on at the gut lining. 
but yeah, all in all, when it's come to good testing, I, I really like that Cyrex Labs one because it. Um, I've only actually looked at three of those, and it looks great. So uh, uh, this is the micro U biome, um, uh, but yeah, I think in fact a couple of people in this room have sent me their their results. So uh, yeah, it look, looks very very good. Um, very happy with the yeah, extent at which it gives us a layout. And again, it's, it's the uh, gene technology which allows us to get more useful. Information. So I didn't quite hear that. I didn't hear that. Oh, no, 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 not to the raw data, no. Yes? Uh, I have a question about biofilm. You touched on okay, that. Okay, yes. Um, so how do you know if you have a problem with UC and you have some bacteria hidden uh, mm. with biofilms? And my second within that question is, what kind of protocol do you put in place to get rid of it? Okay, um, so I actually deliberately didn't focus too much on the biofilms because I think it's a very complicated topic in its own right. Um, and the one risk sometimes when I talk about biofilms is that people email me three weeks later and they say, so I took some anti-biofilm measures and I feel horrendous. <laughs> so biofilms exist everywhere across the body. The most common one you'll see is dental plaque. Um, that's simply the bacteria that live on our teeth protecting themselves with a film so that they are much better prepared uh, against our immune system trying to kill them. But that also occurs within the sinus, within the gut. And biofilms aren't necessarily a bad thing. They can help protect our good guys too. Um, the key problem occurs in when individuals have been subject to a long-term uh, issue, especially regards poor digestion, poor energy, the rate of growth on their, their mucoid lining can actually harness the, the, the growth of biofilms of the bad guys, at which point we can see a community that hide behind a film which shields them from the effects of the immune system. In those instances, we can run multiple uh, antidysbiosis protocols and never really get anywhere. So breaking them down with apple cider vinegar, apolactoferrin, N-acetylcysteine, um, there's a multitude of different options that we can use to actually break them apart. If anybody wants more information afterwards, I've, I've got um, some slides I can send them on that. But what I would always urge is to be very cautious with that because you are ripping open Pandora's box when you do that. And if somebody is feeling awful, their sleep's poor, their inflammatory response is dysregulated, well, we know the reason they're not getting success, it isn't because of the biofilms. If somebody's feeling good and strong, but not perfect. If their sleep's decent, but not great. If they're going about life and everything's about right, but there's just this ongoing inflammation, that's a perfect time to start looking at biofilms and whether that might be stopping them from feeling great. So that's my one, one warning about the biofilm. That was a really great talk. Thanks. Uh, really enjoyed it. Can you tell us a bit more about the benefits, if any, of prebiotics, specifically yeah. consuming bacillium husk or inulin on a daily basis? Yeah, so uh, prebiotics is quite a lot more uh, options now. So inulin has been a, a, a common one for ages. Bacillium husk works m more so as a bulk, but equally it can play a as a prebiotic as well to nourish the good guys. Another very common one is bimuno. Uh, some people use uh, green uh, potato, starch, uh, sorry, green banana, uh, starch. Um, you can use uh, potato starch as well. So there's multiple uh, options open to us for prebiotics. Chicory is another one. Jerusalem artichoke is another one. And I don't automatically use prebiotics because for a lot of people, if you've got particular disturbances in your gut microbiome, we can't guarantee that the good guys are gonna get fed. So I would always introduce the prebiotics slowly. If they get a teeny little bit of gas and that disappears after two, three days, great. Onwards we go and increase the dosage. But if they continually get discomfort and gas, then we can very easily assess that actually these prebiotics are not reaching their destination and instead they're being gobbled up by the bad guys. So in that sense, we're going to need to take a tactical step back, undertake some killing off of the bad guys, hopefully after going through a, a checklist that somebody has carefully prepared, and then 
try it again. But yes, prebiotics very, very helpful to maintain good health long term because in theory none of us should need probiotics every day. It's not a bad thing to take them, kefir being a perfect example, sauerkraut being a perfect example. But yes, the prebiotics, excellent role in maintaining good gut balance, but also nourishing the populations that you've just put in as well. But if it's not working, there's often a very simple reason for that. Yes? Uh, given inflammation can show up in probably many different ways, yeah. uh, do you have any tests that you think that show many different markers that would Basically, an, inf an inflammation test covers many different markers. Or do you have to be more targeted? Yeah, so um, short answer is no, um, because it can manifest in so many different ways. I mean, I can run cytokine profiles through TDL, but even then, it very rarely gives us any information that would help in the long term. So in terms of is somebody inflamed or not, after five minutes in the clinic, it's normally one of the easiest questions I could ask. So um, I'm much less bothered about answering that question, are they inflamed or not, much more focused on where within my, uh, my cycle are we likely to see the biggest results. So obviously, as you can see here, there's actually quite a lot of different angles in which we can get in control of inflammation. Um, and this is why it can sometimes be frustrating for people to say, well, if you get control of the gut, you've solved everything, because everything uh, begins in the gut. And other individuals say, well, the adrenals control it all. Other individuals might talk about the role of energy signaling, and therefore everything's a thyroid thing. And all of those factors are really important. So, short answer is no. <laughs> um, so, I wanted to better understand why antimicrobials are good, because I've read beforehand that antibiotics can actually cause a lot of damage to yeah. the gut flora, and people can develop diseases such as Crohn's disease by taking antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yes, and that's a really uh, important question because I think most of us can see how the use of antibiotics can wipe out all the good guys. And the very issue there is that they are indiscriminate. Uh, even if we take probiotics alongside our antibiotics, hopefully not exactly together, hopefully with a four hour window between them. But even if we do that for safety, we are still likely to see a reduction in the diversity of the microbes that are left whenever you take antibiotics. So in that sense, the risk of taking antibiotics, the risk of not taking antibiotics, both should be worked out, whereas typically in hospitals, it's more a case of, well, you're ill, so take the antibiotics and maybe your virus will get better. Um, but yes, so why do we not see that in natural antimicrobials and and I wouldn't say that it's a black and white thing I have seen uh, natural antimicrobials have some negative impacts but it seems extremely rare to see that there's nothing in the uh, scientific literature which would indicate that the, we ever see any negative outcomes from them it seems to be more a case of they work or we just don't really get any results and I suspect that's more to do with evolution um, all of these items are uh, natural compounds that humans have consumed over the course of hundreds of thousands of years. And thus, if humans were to arrive at this point in evolution with the microbiome that they should have, then those specific microbes have had hundreds of thousands of years to develop some resistance against these items. And thus, there's that opportunity for a symbiotic relationship hence why we just don't seem to see the same problems. Uh, I'd like to uh, yes. two, more, two more questions. Okay. I think that put us on about six questions, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Um, right. I, uh, you mentioned getting colds, and I found out that I'm getting almost every month mm -hmm. a cold. Yeah. And I was starting wondering, was it that a gut uh, response or an immune response, or just how do I stop it? It's, yeah. It's so, of course, the first thing, if someone's getting a cold regularly, then I'm considering, well, are they actually catching microbes? 
that they are unable to respond to, in which case, yeah, we're looking at the basic nutritional support for their immune system, glutathione, vitamin D, adrenals are the ones that I mentioned, but there is obviously more to it than that. We're also looking at are they getting sufficient sleep? Uh, is there excessive stress? I would also be looking at what might be secretly suppressing the immune system. Could there be mold exposure, parasite burden? So those would be the first things that I would take a look at. But as you touch on as well, it's also worthwhile considering what if this isn't actually a cold and this is endotoxemia driving a disproportionate inflammatory response all across the body, meaning that any area, maybe the sinuses, that are this far away from spilling over into a huge inflammatory response, they're on the edge of the cliff. Endotoxemia kicks them over the edge and suddenly the same symptoms happen <coughs> again and again and you feel horrible. So that, that's how I would look. Right, so we got one last question. So you said that if you have a full load immune response, it's costly for the body, but it's a good thing to have because it clears everything out and says the system. What do you, roughly? Like, yeah. So if you've got someone stuck in the halfway house where yeah. they can't respond, would you support the system in the way that you actually create? That the body, that, would you help the body to get to a stage where it can create the full response to actually then deal with what's invading? In theory, um, so yes, yeah, so what we're talking about there is that in any chronic inflammatory concern, what we're almost always seeing is stress invoking more inflammation. Um, the endotoxemia and the interaction between those endotoxins and your immune cells invoking more inflammation. So there's this everything promoting inflammation across the board, and yet there isn't permission to invoke a full response. So Historically, uh, one method that's used, exactly what you're talking about there, is Coley's toxins. This is actually one of the first statistically uh, acknowledged cancer cures over 100 years ago, which slightly improved people's chances of survival, where they would deliberately infect people in order to invoke a fever. And in doing so, we'd get a major response, which just so happens to be what's needed to produce certain signaling compounds, PDL1, MIR55, etc. These are the compounds that now actually bring down the curtains on the immune response. So, for most immune responses, you actually need to reach here in order to finish it. So, in theory, I would be very happy to do that and actually encourage an immune response. But for most people I'm working with, we actually need to dampen it down to begin with purely because they're in this catch-22 situation where because of their immune uh, inflammation, they've got this huge stress burden, which of course continually drains their resources, which actually then invokes more burden on them, which then of course causes more inflammation. And so actually we just need to bring that down to a tolerable level first at which point we can actually start nourishing them, at which point we can actually start restocking their resources, uh, we can allow for functional energy signaling so that when it's time to then go for an antidysbiosis protocol, now they can hit it. So in almost all cases, got to bring them down and then bring them up. But that's more of a practical concern. Theoretically, yes, um, it's valid to look at driving it from the start. <laughs>